So is it difficult to be so far from home during a pandemic? Uh, it is and it isn't. Uh, the interesting thing about being this far from home, uh, we, we, uh, we miss our grandkids. Uh, yeah. But we talk to them just about every day. And we know that at least for the first 10 weeks of the lockdown in Michigan, uh, we wouldn't have seen them anyway. Uh, our son and daughter-in-law would not have taken our grandkids to see Opa and Oma. Yeah. Uh, we know that they didn't see their other grandpa and grandma during that 10 weeks. So it's kind of like, well, we wouldn't have seen them anyway. But sure, the, the issues and the concerns, uh, sure, you'd like to be home. Yeah. But I also frequently say if we're going to be on lockdown, the Netherlands is not a bad place to be locked down. Yeah, uh, why is that? I actually think it's been a pretty intelligent lockdown. Uh, you know, you could always go to just about any store that you wanted to here. Now, there might be restrictions that would say, you know, only three people uh, in the winkel op een keer. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, you could still go. And in Michigan, you know, there was a period of a number of weeks where all the small stores would, were shut. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you couldn't go into the big stores and you couldn't buy paint. Uh, you know, there are certain mm. lots of restrictions that from here didn't appear to make any sense. And I think it's run pretty well here in the Netherlands. Yeah. Yeah. That's great to hear. Um, well, along with the pandemic, there's always there's also been another crisis situation in the United States, namely the riots following uh, the death uh, on uh, George Floyd's death. And... Um, We heard President Donald Trump speaking about the protests uh, over his death and um, from, the right, from the White House, threatening to mobilize the U.S. military uh, to end the, quote, riots and lawlessness. Um, it seems that the administration do does, doesn't really have a grip on the situation, and we were wondering how is the administration right now seeking justice against uh, police brutality? Well, remember, the both issues that you've identified uh, – are primarily not the responsibility of Washington, D.C., the president, or that. Mm -hmm. They are the responsibility uh, of our governors and local law enforcement. So the governors make the decision as to how they are going to control the demonstrations, the riots, uh, the violence in our communities. It, uh, it starts with the mayor. Uh, if the mayor believes that they don't have adequate resources, they can request assistance Uh, from the governor. Uh, the governor could then could provide typically state police uh, or call in the National Guard uh, to restore order. Same with the prosecution. The Justice Department may get involved uh, in terms of bringing federal charges against this police officer, uh, but the first line of prosecution happens locally. But still, the federal government does have an influence on how governors will react. We've seen Trump asking uh, or urging uh, these governors to um, to have total domination over the riots. Um, how do you see this um, increasing the efforts for uh, you know diminishing police brutality in the United States? Well, you've got, again, two different issues. One is the philosophy of the administration is we need to keep the protesters within the framework mm -hmm. of legality. You know, we don't want people breaking windows. We don't want people looting. We don't want people uh, injuring other folks. We don't want people attacking the police or vice versa. Uh, so that's one. Uh, the second thing is we want and we need the federal government, and this could happen through the Justice Department, Uh, holding cities and holding law enforcement agencies accountable uh, for what might be called systemic racism or, you know, unfair treatment of, in this case, black civilians. I think Sarah might be hinting at a slightly different thing because you're focusing very much right now on policy, which I think completely right there. But I think she's focusing more on the rhetoric Right. So you do we do place a responsibility on the president to be a sort of leader during crisis. Right. Someone to be calm, someone that you can really trust to, I guess, secure the country. And so, for instance, I do want to ask you about a rhetoric question. Trump yesterday on his Twitter, and I understand it's always quite difficult when people read out tweets, but he said that my administration has done more for the black community than any president since Abraham Lincoln. So I'm just wondering how that improves the country. Right. 
that is technically, I could argue that that would be actually facilitating more difficulties and chaos in the country when it comes to these crises, right? It, you could, Do you, you, agree? Could, you could reach that conclusion. But what do you okay. think about it? Well, I mean, I think it's, you know, what the pre- you can't argue with the content. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can say it may or may not be the appropriate time for the president to bring this up. Um, but when you take a look at record low unemployment for the African com- African-American yep. community, mm-hmm. uh, when you take a look at rising wages uh, for minority populations, these are things that... You know, lots of people across the political spectrum have been arguing for uh, for a couple of decades. What are we going to do to raise the standard of living for all Americans? Yes, sir. Uh, and and, t- mm-hmm. and typically, the you know people would say, "Well, we've seen wage growth for the middle class." Code words. We've seen you know wage increase for white America, uh, mm-hmm. but we haven't seen it for. Uh, the African American community. We haven't seen it for this uh, group of Americans. And with the policies that the administration has put in place, they have seen improvement mm-hmm. in what have been long term issues in America. But could we try to separate the two? Because I think many American citizens are, are quite happy about that, right? There's a valid argument. I would that hope all Americans yeah, all, would be happy about, about that. It, yeah. But yeah. But employment is low. These are great things. But you can still think that those are good measurements, but at the same time think that this tweet is really uncalled for and is actually potentially dangerous, right? This is the big, I would say, largest critique that's often levered against Trump. This just needless, I guess, tweeting and, I don't know, like, what is your real opinion on the tweet, my administration has done more for the black community than any president since Abraham Lincoln yesterday when protests are going on throughout the country? Like, we can agree that that's just... I'm not, not sure well we could planned. agree that that it's uh, that it's incentive incent, uh, well maybe not incentivizing conflict but just not good. Well, well, I mean, again, I am sitting and you, we're both watching the United States from 3,500 mm-hmm. miles away. All right, I don't know what various people, NORS organizations, and everything have been saying about the president and what the exact dialogue that's going on on a, on a daily basis. Okay, our are people saying this is an administration that has done nothing for the African American community? At which point in time, a response like that might be a perfectly appropriate response. I I can't get into mm-hmm. the, that kind of finite detail. If I were living uh, in Michigan, if I were a member of Congress, uh, and I was living through this process in real time and part of the discussion. Uh, in the United States, I'd be in a much better position okay. to do this than saying, well, you know, hey, whoom, here comes this, you know, tweet. Yeah. Uh, Pete, what do you think? I don't have the context. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. I understand. yeah. Uh, but still, we see that um, making statements as threatening to mobilize the U.S. military is um, quite quite the statement to to make in such times and um, actually if you compare it to the um, support that the United States administration has had for the riots uh, past November and October in Hong Kong we can see that there's quite a difference in uh, in the support and in the uh, the response to these to these riots so the United States was very supportive of the right to take over the streets um, in Hong Kong but now protests of the same level are happening in the United States we see a different response. So Trump is, as I said, urging uh, states to dominate the riots. Um, otherwise, they are, quote, wasting their time. Doesn't this seem at least a little hypocritical to you? Not once you get in, again, you're, take, you're taking two different, at two different mm-hmm. sets of time mm-hmm. and in two different political environments. Mm-hmm. Of course. Okay? My daughter lives in Minneapolis. She lived through, and I don't remember exactly the number of nights where uh, the streets of Minneapolis appear to have been lawless where she was glad she was in her apartment and she wasn't a mile away uh, riding her bike through town or walking through town and feeling very, very uncomfortable. She felt more comfortable and confident that the community she lives in, a community she loves, that you know, the National Guard did come in, that the mayor and the governor decided that the National Guard needed to come in and restore law and order. She was tired of... <laughs> people destroying, you know, her downtown in the area that uh, that she lives in. You know, she was glad when uh, 
I think it was it was either a Trader Joe's or a Whole Foods mm-hmm. moved in. Classic. Uh, you know, a week or excuse me, a block away from her house. Mm-hmm. They're now boarded up. They were closed for four or five days, uh, and she hopes that they stay. Yes. All right. And because you'll read in a lot of these, you know, in a lot of these areas or whatever, what's the problem? There's no grocery stores. You can't go buy groceries. So she was, she was more confident in her security and the future of her community when she saw that law enforcement, along with the National Guard, was establishing order in her community. Yes, I understand that. But I, yes. I do think that the riots in the United States... Um, can be compared, at least in level of severity, to the riots that have been happening in Hong Kong in October and November 2019. So how come that the response um, to the riots in the U.S. has been so different to the complete support that has been uh, been given to the riots in Hong Kong? Well, two things. I think in both cases, the underlying cause of the riot the United States would be very supportive of, and this administration would be very supportive of. We are against police brutality, all right? We believe in the rights of every individual uh, to a safe and secure uh, life in a safe and secure environment, the due process of law Mm -hmm. in Hong Kong, uh, that that these protesters had a right to freedom uh, and to live within the the framework that was agreed to upon, what, 25 years ago with the transition uh, of power. Uh, What you don't, and what you don't have in the United States is a tolerance for a protest that is very, very appropriate saying, this is what we want as Americans, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yeah. Okay, it's right there at the beginning. And to then take that and to move that into protest where you're breaking through windows, you're burning police cars, mm-hmm. uh, and you are looting stores. That's, that's, we're not, that's not who we are. Let me ask you a different question. When, yes. When, when the riots are over, what is going to happen against police brutality then? Well, the, you'll, you'll see a number of things. I mean, we've gone through this. We went through it with Ferguson. Uh, and we've had some other cases against this. Mm-hmm. Uh, there will be, we'll do uh, a research study, mm-hmm. okay, exactly how severe is this problem of police brutality. Um, but it's pretty severe. So, well, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to make a judgment on whether, you know, what, what is severe and what is not, okay? We know that the, what, what happened uh, a, li- <laughs> a little over a week ago was awful, yep. okay? I think... I would like to believe that anybody who's looking at that tape uh, is going to say, God, you know, what yeah. happened here? Yeah. Not only to the, the law enforcement official who had their knee on, on George's neck, but also the three people that yep. were standing around yeah. him yeah. and didn't do anything. Okay. And so, but I think I'm not willing to go from, that and say, you know, it's awful in America, okay? Again, you'll find that there are a tre- tremendous number of law-abiding, very honorable people in our mm-hmm. police force who go out on a daily basis and risk their lives. But, you know, we will go out and they will find out, uh, try to identify what the problem is here. Is, you know, uh, is, it, is it poor, in these cases, were, was it a poor selection process? Was it a, a poor management process? I've, I've read reports. I don't have all the details and, and that, but people have said that you know there have been complaints about at least some of these four officers before. Um, yep. You know, were were not appropriate steps taken. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, but hopefully that's what's going to go through there, and then they will take a look at um, you know the underlying causes, and that we will develop policies, procedures, training, uh, broader social reform policies uh, that will address this problem. So I think the sentiment, the premise is that something does need to change, but could you just really pinpoint like a specific change 
Like what will actually, so the selection procedure. I'm, what you know, I'm not, I'm not, again, I'm not, not gonna, there, no, okay? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not there. Um, but and, there is agency to change things within these well, policies. Well, clearly there, there's, a, there's an, uh, an, a need to understand and address this problem, yep. okay? Yep. Let's move on to China. I have a quote here by the Secretary of State. This is a Chinese Communist Party that has come to view itself as intent upon the destruction of Western ideas, Western democracies, Western values. It puts Americans at risk. Pretty intense statement. Mm -hmm. What is the United States' future relationship with China coming outside of this pandemic? Well, I think it's not only what is the, uh, what's the agenda for the United States, what's the agenda for like-minded allies, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. for Western democracies. What's yeah. the, what's, what does this mean for Europe? What does it mean for South Korea, for Japan and Australia? I think it's going to be, we need to confront China. You know, in 2001, when I was in Congress, we had a vote on what was called the permanent normal trade relations with China, whether to allow China into mm -hmm. the WTO. Mm -hmm. uh, I voted against it. We, we have been going through uh, an annual process where every year we would have a vote as to whether China would have those privileges. It was a leverage point to got, try to get China uh, to change. Yeah. And I thought we still needed that leverage. There were the people that were on the other side of this said, hey, if we can get China into the WTO, they will reform themselves. They will respect intellectual property. They will do this whole series of uh, reforms that will make them you know, more like us in terms of respecting human rights and, and all of those types of things. That did not happen. And so China is a huge market, but we have to recognize that at the same time, the Chinese Communist Party embraces a whole set of values that we in the West do not embrace. So what does that confrontation look like? Because we can agree that there's a problem, something needs to change. What is the United States government, or the allies for that matter, going to do? Well, I think there's a, a number of things. It, it, mm -hmm. Number one is a reaffirmation that the most important relationship that we each have is the transatlantic relationship. The United States has no better partner than Europe, and Europe has no better partner than the United States, and that we need to streamline and strengthen our trade relationship where there's still room for improving that trade relationship by reducing tariffs and making each other the most attractive market for us to do business with. Uh, we need to continue to strengthen uh, our investment in national security uh, mm -hmm. capabilities. Uh, so this is where... You know, we, we do need a NATO. NATO has, you know, kept Western Europe safe and secure for 70 years. That mission continues to evolve and is still very, very necessary. You're concerned? No, I think, no, I mean, the... Um, Not scared, but you're treating it as a real concern. If you're the, increasing national security spending, that's pretty... Well, no, but uh, what, what we, this goes back to 2014. Mm -hmm. Okay, where yep. we, uh, where the members of NATO identified a series of capabilities that we needed to have to keep NATO strong and relevant, uh, and some there have been some more emerging threats in terms of cybersecurity yep. and uh, and those types of things that we now need additional capabilities yep. for. But this decision was made back in 2014 that it was reaffirmed we need a strong okay. NATO that meets the challenges of today. Uh, getting back to the China yeah, issue, what, what yeah. does it also then entail? Uh, it entails starting to outline expectations of behavior for, for China. And that says, we want to integrate you from a, a, an economic standpoint. But that means that when uh, you've got inventors and entrepreneurs who develop a new product and a new capability, and they patent it, uh, and they have intellectual property, that means you can't go rip it mm -hmm. off, yep. okay? Uh, it means that if you, if a Dutch company or an American company wants to go and do business in China, we can go do business in China the same way that we allow Chinese companies to come and do business in the United States. We allow, you know, we'll allow a, comp a Chinese company to the United States, and they can set up their wholly owned subsidiary. 
You go into China with an American company or a Dutch company, it's kind of like, oh, by the way, uh, you can own 49% uh, and, the, and China will own 51%. Um, now, no, we will, we, will, we will have reciprocity. We will have the same access uh, for our goods and services uh, into China that you have into the West. Uh, there are also human rights expectations. Uh, you cannot continue to uh, prosecute. Uh, persecute uh, the Uyghurs and these types of things. But so it becomes, an, uh, and we want China to be a clean country, that there are envir environmental standards, you know, basically between the United States and Europe, we have equivalency, meaning the outcome of the, the work that we do uh, uh, in our economy. Well, we're able to keep our environment clean, we're able, able to keep our air clean, we take a different approach at doing that than Europe, but there's an equivalency. Um, and that there's an expectation that China will rise to that standard. And if they don't? If they don't, we have, there, there's a possibility that we create a, a green environment zone, which would be, you know, Europe, the United States, uh, people that have certain minimal criteria in place and say, oh, by the way, if, you're, if you don't meet these criteria, uh, shipping into the green zone, mm -hmm. there'll be a 15% tariff. Okay. And what would these criteria look like? Well, it would look very much in terms of uh, water quality, air quality. Uh, you go right down the list. The things that we in the United States and you in Europe uh, measure and the things that you believe are important to restoring... Mm -hmm and improving the environment of Europe or the United States. Yeah. So... Could I just quickly, just one more question? Yeah. Sorry. Because you were mentioning, because I, I appreciate this answer. I think it's a good one, right? The increased expectations for China is something you want in regards to intellectual property. But we haven't been having this issue for the last decade. Right? Sure so, you have. So like how... We've been having this. We've been yeah. having this issue with China for the last twenty but years. Exactly, but how? Because we've been having issues with intellectual property to begin with for the last decade. And now we're going to say respect intellectual property. Like, how exactly is that going to change now that you just write down your expectations before? Well, right? what um, we're actually going to put teeth into the policy. We, you know, yeah. this is why they. This is why we by having <coughs> them come into the WTO. The expectation was. They will respect intellectual property. They haven't. They haven't changed their behavior. So it, the, it's now incumbent on Europe and the United States to say, okay, we gave you 20 years. You haven't changed your behavior. I think mm -hmm. many of us believe we should have changed that behavior and become more firm with them 10 years ago uh, when it became clear, the pattern became clear that, hey, guys, they're not going to change their behavior. Mm -hmm. They're going to continue to rip us off uh, and rip our entrepreneurs, our inventors off, and they're going to take some of the most valuable stuff we have, our, our intellectual capital up up there, uh, and they're going to steal it. Mm -hmm. uh, and but we decided, you know, we're not going to confront it ten years ago. Uh, we now need to confront it, okay? And we we will hold them accountable in our court systems. We will hold them account accountable in, in Europe's legal framework, uh, and we may need to have access uh, into the, the Chinese system. I mean, the, the best way to respect intellectual property for a European, for an American that rips you off, you can come to the American court system and you're going to get justice. We yeah. will protect your intellectual property. We expect the same thing when we come here to Europe. Mm -hmm. What we need is the Chinese government to do the same thing in China. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important to touch on, on these, um, these common values. And I think especially in this pandemic, a common value um, that is highly needed is transparency. And um, we've seen that that's been a big criticism um, towards China during this pandemic, uh, supposedly lack of transparency. And that has been also one of the reasons to um, withdraw the contribution uh, from the WHO. And we were wondering, how is the country that's been given... Uh, giving the largest contribution to the WHO, how is withdrawing that contribution an improvement for everyone? It's much better than giving 
400, 450 million dollars to an organization that doesn't work. But we still, now we now have 450 million dollars from the United States mm -hmm. uh, that we can pump into organizations that will actually make a difference. So, what are the concrete changes that you would like to see happening in the WHO then? Well, the, the concrete changes is we'd like them to call it as they see it. When mm -hmm. they see a pandemic breaking out in China, we'd like them to call it out and say, hey, there is a pandemic breaking out in China, and we'd like to see them do it, you know, very, very much at the forefront. But a bit more specific, because, I mean, they got wrong information. They processed that incorrectly. Then identify where you got the wrong information from. You got it from the Chinese mm -hmm. government, and the Chinese government wasn't being transparent at the same time that the WHO was defending China and calling out their you know, their excellent response uh, to uh, the COVID crisis. They've, they've not been honest brokers throughout this process. But doesn't the $450 million contribution from the United States also give a certain bargaining power inside the, the uh, organization? And possibly, okay, we've, we, you know, we approached our, our allies uh, to confront, and the interesting thing here is, I couldn't find, I, I don't think we can find anybody in our Western partners or alliance that didn't recognize and call for the reform uh, in an investigation of the WHO. So how come the United States is the only country to withdraw its contribution then? Well, you'll have, you know, we don't decide what the Dutch do. We don't decide what the French and what the Any Germans speculation? do. What's that? Any speculation? That's for them to uh, answer those questions for you. The United States said, you know, short of fundamental change within the WHO, uh, we're going to take that money and we're going to invest it where we think we can actually make a meaningful difference uh, and where those dollars can actually uh, have an impact. We're not, going to we're not going to continue putting money into an organization that we think that, that it doesn't work. Now, the... The people that are left uh, in the WHO, they can say, okay, you know, we still see this as the way to go. We recognize it needs reform. Uh, they can lead the reform effort. We'll, we'll be more than willing to contribute to that with suggestions and those kinds of things. And if the WHO reforms itself, mm -hmm. the, the opportunity, always, uh, opportunity always exists for the United States to come back uh, and, again, become part of it. So it has been a couple of weeks since the withdrawal, since the withdrawal um, of the contribution. Have you seen any concrete changes since, since then? I, I don't, you know. The, uh, there have been some countries that have been consistent through this process. Australia has been very, very consistent in demanding uh, reform uh, from the WHO. I don't see, having them, I don't see them having pulled out yet, and I don't, haven't seen yet uh, a serious attempt to outline the specific reforms that need to happen with the WHO right now. So do you think they're less concerned about these issues? You'll have to ask them. Okay, I'm not, yeah. you know. So, because I'm having a little bit of difficulty understanding, because at the same time, the World Health Organization is just an international organization with a bunch of member states that are supposed to have equal weighting, right? And the Chinese government was able to put Tedros in, if we believe that theory, so wouldn't just the argument be is to just change the authority of the World Health Organization? It doesn't get more complex than that. That could be a reform, yeah, or to change the leadership. Yeah, so I guess what we're also going on is because it seems a bit odd for us that a country that has been giving $450 million, very much more than any other country within the Actually, World Health Organization, yeah. loses so much power. So, for instance, how did China, that's giving a $44 million donation, end up so much in control? The, um, you got a couple of things. Number one, yeah. we are the largest donor mm -hmm. yeah. uh, in terms of do, you know, a single chunk. Uh, but a lot of our allies, uh, on a per capita basis, you know. Donate more. No, nah, they donate about, they donate about the, roughly the same. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's not that they're way above us, yeah. uh, way below us. Uh, we're all, rel I think we're all pretty relatively close in a band of uh, depending on, I think we do it in, in two-year tranches and uh, others, you know, but it, it, it's kind of like a, a, there's a band of, mm -hmm. uh, of us that are all relatively close. Uh, I think in, uh, in certain cases, the, uh, we, you know, the United States and maybe others didn't pay enough attention to exactly where this organization was going or what it was doing. 
uh, you know, it's kind of like it's out there. I mean, we're, we're partners to hundreds of these organizations and we didn't pay enough attention. Um, and now when actually a pandemic comes out, uh, it's like, whoa, what are these people yeah. doing? Uh, and, we, and you look at their performance and say, whoa, then this is this is clearly a problem. Um, and it may be a problem that we, you, you could argue that said, you know, you should have seen this earlier. Uh, yes. And it, that could be true, or it's kind of like the weaknesses didn't pop up until uh, you actually ran into a pandemic and then you watched exactly how it worked. Did it step up to the challenge uh, or did it fall far short? So if you're seeing that it's falling far short right now, so you're, so the critic is that, the criticism is that the WHO is getting um, way more China-centric. Doesn't stepping out of the WHO only give more room for China's influence that would be the logical reasoning that would apply to this it may have it may have more China may have more impact uh, in the WHO sure but that's but okay. isn't, that, but, isn't that problematic well we can't you know we, we believe that there's we believe that there's another way to address this pandemic uh, outside of the WHO and uh, as we develop the patterns and the relationships to you know deal with this pandemic and to deal with future uh, issues along this line. If a more effective way to develop, if a more effective way is identified to develop, then the WHO becomes irrelevant. So then it's China, not China. the concern of reforming the World Health Organization. We, uh, the preference would be to reform the World Health Organization. They have a built-in capacity and capability. All right. So, uh, but short of reform, then it's kind of like, no, we're not going to contribute, continue to contribute. We're not going to continue contributing to an organization that is going to waste our money. But like, I'm just wondering if you can reason with me, because I think there is a pragmatic I'm not sure answer. I can reason you from yeah. me. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm just wondering, because I think there's plenty of people that think it wasn't great what the World Health Organization has done. They're concerned about China's influence. And then they are even doubly concerned because now organizations where the United States could maybe serve as a leader actually have the influence that they're required. Now they're reducing that chance, right? So is it necessarily mutually exclusive having to withdraw the $450 million while also trying to produce the right reform changes for the international institution. Well, it, it now becomes the responsibility for someone else, uh, for you know, the EU, uh, other countries, uh, to go into the World Health Organization or to invite the mm -hmm. United States back in and saying, we're going to be serious about reform uh, and here specifically is what we're going to do, and we need you to help us do that. It's a little bit of an American first mentality. No, yeah, right? it's, it's what? America Seems like first. It, yeah. Why America first? Well, just because, right, I think I'm not trying to do a real trope, but everyone's looking for a bit of solidarity right now. People are universally struggling. And then the international organization, which made mistakes, don't get me wrong, you have one of the major players dropping out, and then, you know, if the reforms don't come, it's kind of eh, it's... They'll figure it out. You know, yeah, you understand why that's a little bit. No, difficult. I don't, because the 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 problem here is not the World Health Organization. It's okay? a symptom of a larger issue. The the issue is confronting and defeating the pandemic. That is what the yeah. United States is focused mm -hmm. on. Um, and so, you know, we have been extremely generous, helping people around the world, helping countries around the world, sending a hundred million dollars to Italy, a quote unquote rich country. Uh, where we normally do mm -hmm. not send aid. Uh, we, we develop and expand the relationship with Philips so that they can build more ventilators and respirators uh, in the United States of America. We send, uh, I think it's 486 million, something like that. Uh, we send it to Janssen here mm -hmm. in uh, the Netherlands uh, to develop a vaccine and begin building, I think, uh, a production facility that may never be used for this vaccine, but if their vaccine is successful, to cut down the uh, the investment time, uh, you know, it's, instead of doing things boom, 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 and say, okay, if you do it this way, it's going to take four years. Mm -hmm. But if you do the testing of the development of the vaccine and the testing of the vaccine at the same time that you're building the production facility for that vaccine, mm -hmm. it's like, well, that's going to shorten yeah. this by. 12, yeah. 18 months. Uh, I think uh, we have contributed uh, or set aside uh, four to five billion dollars to share. We, we, I think we also just did it with a company in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing. Yeah. Uh, investments to 
allow companies to shorten the time to get to a vaccine. Yeah. And those are American dollars. That's what we're, you know, we're not, sure, we can, we'd love the WHO to, to, to work first. And if we said, hey, like you said, America first, ah, we're taking our money and we're going home and we're just going to, you know, we're just mm-hmm. going to fix this pandemic for the United States. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the rest of the world, forget it. But that's not what we're doing. We're providing aid around the world, Mm -hmm. and we are investing generously in getting to a pandemic uh, with the requirements that when we get to a a vaccine, that that fact that the production facilities will be available uh, so that those vaccines will very quickly be available on a global Mm -hmm. supply. So you're mentioning some domestic policy changes and some efforts that are... um, put into defeating this virus domestically. So let's take a look about on what the current administration could have done better, in your opinion. In terms of the, uh, the pandemic? Yes. Well, remember, in, in the United States, what we do is it's not the... It's not, again, it's not Washington. Washington provides information mm-hmm. to the states who then also have their own health officials... And then we, you know, we, we ended up with at least 50 different models mm-hmm. for how to confront, contain, and ulti- ultimately defeat the pandemic. Yeah. What about the Defense Act, right? That's something that the president, federal government can utilize right. in this, regards to the pandemic? Uh, we did. This is what we used with, with Phillips. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there were, com- you know, there were media outlets here that said, oh, you know, they're doing the Defense Act because then when Phillips builds respirators, the United States can claim them all for themselves. Yeah. Wrong. Of course, they never wrote the story that it was wrong uh, because what we did with, the, with Phillips, and I was talking to Phillips and I was talking to the White House and others in Washington pretty much on a daily basis. And what Phillips was saying, Pete, we need the White House to use the Defense Production Act, Procurement Act for our benefit if they give us a piece of paper that says Phillips falls under this law, we can take that to our suppliers, which then means that our suppliers have to produce our parts first. And they, if we need more, they have to produce more of our parts before they go on and do something else. That enables us then to quickly ramp up production Uh, So instead of producing 40,000 ventilators, maybe we can do 50, maybe we can do 60,000 ventilators in that same amount of time. Uh, And that's exactly how it was implemented. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, again, Europe... uh, Let's stay on the U.S. We'll stay on on the U.S. (laughs) Because the the U.S. has been very, very uh, open in sharing our technology, our capabilities, and our products... Uh, with the rest of the world. Uh, there have been other places mm-hmm. of the world that have been more restrictive in saying, we're going to keep this for ourselves before we make it available anywhere else. Yeah, so I think actually right now there's also a surplus of ventilators, if I'm not mistaken, because the current administration, they actually produce more. But on a yeah. different variable, testing, right? Because Fauci was saying in the beginning, there was a big question of why were we not able to mobilize at the time, right, in regards to testing. Do you think that in hindsight maybe... Trump or the current administration should have used the Defense Act for testing in order to get the adequate supply? I don't know. You don't know? Okay. I mean, I don't, I don't have the specifics on that. The, I know that testing has been a problem, um, you know, all around. I think uh, mm-hmm. just here in the, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, they finally opened it up for more testing uh, two days ago. Uh, yeah. on, well, you know, uh, on June 1, they opened it up for more testing. Yeah, they could okay. They they were very mm-hmm. restrictive uh, on on the testing, and again, it's been different. Uh, there's been a different patchwork of testing, I think, across the states as well. Yeah, because I've been having difficulty with this thing, which is that Trump was blaming the previous administration for having bad tests, bad broken tests, and obsolete tests, right? And there's an argument that the mobilization of tests have been kind of lackluster in the United States. So, according to the experts, not enough tests have actually been produced. So, I'm wondering, using Trump's own logic. Can we actually blame the current administration for being somewhat problematic with the lack of tests that they produced? I don't know how fast you can build the test or ramp Mm -hmm. up the production for that. Okay. 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 Yeah. I think we should also separate the conversation between rhetoric and actual policy changes. So don't you think it would be possible that different rhetoric could cause also a different reaction among citizens' behavior and attitude uh, regarding the virus? Um, A leader has a great 
representative uh, function, and um, especially during crises like these. Mm -hmm. Don't you think, um, or actually do you think, that President Trump is setting the right example? The, um, there's, you can always have discussions about should have said this or should have said that and these mm -hmm. kinds of things. I think the president has been, uh, you know, very, very optimistic in terms of developing the medical protocols that would have enabled treatment uh, of this, the development proactively in terms of, of a vaccine, uh, encourage, you know, and the, um, you know, and I think in some ways uh, he listened, uh, he listened pretty strongly to the medical advice that he was getting. I think it will be interesting in six to nine to 12 months uh, to hear the president do an analysis uh, of his performance uh, during mm -hmm. this crisis, weighing the decisions that he made from a health standpoint, from an economic standpoint, mm -hmm. um, you know, and see where, see exactly yeah. where we are. I, I, I have an idea of th some of the things that he might say. Mm -hmm. um, like what? Yeah, I'll let the president say. Yeah. It. But I, I think you know, I, I'm, I'm sure that the, um, you know, because of, you know, and I, and I see it here in the Netherlands as well. I hear people say, you know, you need to listen to the health experts. You need to listen to the health experts. I'm, the health experts only give you a, a context. Mm -hmm. They don't tell you what to do. Okay. Of course, but I think that's exactly the point that I want to touch upon. Great. That um, it's, of course, incredibly, dif uh, incredibly difficult to um, handle during a crisis, during, during a pandemic, when not all information is provided to you. This is a completely new virus. No one knows how to handle this virus correctly. Um, but I do think that rhetoric and consistency in arguments and in attitude towards citizens is an is an incredibly um, important aspect of leadership. I want to touch upon humility and um, ability to reflect. We've seen that Donald Trump has tweeted, sorry for bringing up tweets again, on March 13th that he doesn't take responsibility at all. Um, I'm just wondering, is that a sign of good leadership during a pandemic like this? Is this setting a right example and standing as a great leader? Well, all I can say is that every time somebody brings up tweets, mm -hmm. um, I don't have the context of the tweets. Yeah. You know, somebody comes in and they, they go back and they, you know, this is March 13th, April, May, June. So that's almost three months ago, okay? And you're asking me for my response to a Trump tweet 10 weeks ago. But you don't need much context, right? It's Sure you do. Characters. I mean, it, it, I don't know what question or what the debate was during that day. Of course yeah, you yeah. need well, I think uh, it was, need, I think, need a context. I can give it. you a little context. around. You'll that give same me a part of the context, but I'm sorry. I've learned with the Dutch media that... Hey, we're Americans. Uh, yeah, we're Americans. But, yeah, we can, you're Americans, we, but we, I mean, what, what I've learned, if I'm, gonna, if I'm going to respond specifically to what was in a tweet or something like that... Uh, and I'm not fully aware of the context. I'll go and take a look myself and establish what the context was back then, rather than for someone saying, well, Pete, here was the context. Mm -hmm. uh, so now what do you say? Uh, because we can look at the same different kind of events. I look at it through the eyes of an ambassador. I look at it through the eyes of a former congressman. Mm -hmm. uh, you look through it as, as an eye, uh, through the eyes of a journalist, and you, there are certain things that you see. There are certain things that I may see, which means that we can take a look at it, and mm -hmm. we can see a very, very different context uh, for exactly the same question. Yeah. Would, would but I, I, do, I do think that I'm now bringing up this tweet just as an example, but I think it's a pretty consistent phenomenon of... Um, maybe lack of humility uh, by President Trump. You know, he, during the pandemic, he's been spreading a false accus accusation of murder against a rival. He's been playing golf. He's been refusing to wear a mask. Um, and he's been fighting with social, social media platforms like Twitter, um, who apply, which applied fact checks to his tweets. Mm -hmm. You know, is this the right example, the right leader that we need during extremely fragile times like these? The, this is a president that, with an economic crisis, uh, you know, within, I'm not sure exactly how long it took from when 
Many of the states started going down on, uh, to a lockdown, but relatively quickly passed a $2.2 trillion stimulus package that was passed by the House, which was passed by the Senate 96 to nothing, which passed through the House of Representatives on a voice vote. So there may have been people that... There's you know, one, one Republican. Well, they, 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 on a voice vote, you don't know how many. Okay, you don't mm-hmm. know how Trump many. Trump went after him. After but, but, the, but you don't know. <laughs> I, don't know if it, I, I don't know if it was one or, or if it was 217. I've been there, okay? When it's a voice vote, the, the only ruling is from the chair, the person mm-hmm. sitting at the front, and he, that person says, you know, yeah. the, you know, according to the voice vote, the eyes have it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it was one voice. But well, I, we'll I, have this conversation. But but I'm sure there weren't. I'm sure there weren't 435 people there when they had the yeah, voice yeah, vote. Fair, fair. Okay, it was it was a uh, there there were enough people there that the person uh, in the chair could say a quorum being president, mm-hmm. the eyes have it. Yep. Okay, so I you know at this point in time, uh, you know, the only record is that it passed by a voice vote, uh, which means in most cases it's non-controversial. Because if it's a controversial mm-hmm. vote, uh, then the person, then then someone would typically stand up mm-hmm. and say, "I demand the yeas and the nays," yeah. which mm-hmm. means I want all 435 members of Congress on record yeah. saying I was either in favor of this bill or I was opposed to it. Yeah, I, I still want to go back to the style. Sure. I think we can have a nuanced conversation about this because I don't think President Hoekstra would be acting as President Trump right now. And what you just said before is that the, I think some of the issues, especially with Fauci, this is a critique that's given that medical professionals, experts in these fields are only one side. They're experts in their specific field. When you apply that to politics, economics, it's a very different way mm-hmm. how those things come into fruition. But she is right when asked about the results of the pandemic that Trump said, I don't take any responsibility, right? But he's exactly that person, right, that should be taking that responsibility when it comes to these kind of analyzing what to do with the data that's at his disposal, Right. Well, yeah, but you're not going to get me to accept her tweet. Uh, okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. okay but, it was a, yeah. it was a good try though. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah. Just to slip that in, but uh, didn't work. The, it was just an example, uh, Mr. Oaks. Yeah. <laughs> but I've uh, yeah. Okay, let me give another analogy, and I wonder what your okay. take is on this. I think fewer Americans would be scared if Mike Pence was our president as opposed to Donald Trump. Do you have any idea why I may think that? I mean, the. Um, you can think that. That's fine. But you know President Pence, right? You can understand why I might. Because I, I know Vice President yeah. Pence, yes. I yeah. served with him for 10 years in the House. Yeah, so and I, yeah. I think he's a very honorable man. And for instance, even The Guardian, which is pretty, I would say, let's say, call it left wing for now, I said, strangely competent Mike Pence finds his 9-11 moment in coronavirus crisis. And you have, for instance, DeSantis, the governor of Florida, saying that if the federal government is doing something, that will carry a lot of weight for me, right? So let's imply that there is a responsibility on the federal government to influence governor behavior. Now, I've got a day message between two, and I'll be giving you the context if you want it, but said... Part of the context, but yes. Yeah, he said that coronavirus represents a very serious threat to senior citizens with senior uh, serious underlying health conditions. COVID-19 is typically 10 times deadlier than the flu. And you have Trump three days before. So last year, 37,000 Americans died from the common flu, it averages between 27,000 and 70,000 per year. Nothing is shut down. Life and the economy continue, uh, go on. At this moment, there are 546 cases. Think about that, okay? So you have a different, you can agree that that's a different form of rhetoric between the two. And I've seen press briefings where mm-hmm. when Mike Pence is talking, the press actually ask, is this how it's always going to be? In a sense that it's more clear and it's more coherent. Like, you know him. I think a lot of Americans would be less concerned if they had someone as stoic and I think as calm as Vice President Pence in charge as opposed to Donald Trump. Come on. I, I don't know, okay? I mean, I, I, I know Mike. I like Mike. Mike has served as the, uh, the chairperson of mm-hmm. this uh, task force. I think he's done a great job at doing that. Uh, I think the president, in, in the statement that you're reading... Uh, is also talking about some of these things. And I'm not sure that I inherently I see a conflict. But are, are you not able to answer the question? Because I understand that too if you're not comfortable with it, but I think you understand where I'm getting at, right? 
I understand that there are a lot of people that do not like the style of this president. Mm -hmm. Yes. But the style, I think a lot of people in the beginning understand Trump is this brutal kind of, I would say, more direct person in the sea of politics, right? And there's been benefits to that in certain cases for that side. But especially now, when you have a pandemic and the potential for a lot of people dying, I could understand that that doesn't work the best in this context, right? Yeah, the president has as an objective the the health, the safety, uh, and well-being of of the mayor of Americans. And I think that that is always the priority for whoever is mm-hmm. in those offices, uh, whether it's in governors uh, or whether it's the president of the United States. Eventually and ultimately, they will be evaluated on whether they protected the health and safety Mm -hmm. and well-being of the American citizens. But can Uh, you make that evaluation? Not right now. Not right now. I mean, you can't. You don't have all the information, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, The, we will have a lot more information in in 12 to 18 months. Uh, We'll have a lot more information in three years, okay? I mean, we, we have no idea at this point in time what the economic impact long term will be, okay, based on the damage that has been done by the shutdowns um, and how quickly and effectively the measures that are being taken by Congress, uh, by state governments uh, to respond to the, to the economic downturn, how effective they will be. Mm-hmm. Are the plans that are being put in place, are they the appropriate plans and the best plans to restore the health of the economy? Yeah. So I think one thing we can agree upon is that... There's probably lots of things we can agree on. Yes. I'll, I'll just name one example. We, want, we, we all want to get to the bottom of this, right? We want to know the truth, what's behind the pandemic. And um, we've seen your recent tweet that you've been having lunch with Jensen and you've been discussing uh, that it's time to find truth. Uh, it's time for truth. So what should we learn from your conversation with Jensen? That I learned more about Dutch politics and a, a unique insight. What did you learn? That there are a lot of people uh, who are in favor of, you know, a, a smaller government mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and those types of things. And, you know, but, you know, it's, it's like... My job is to, what part of my job is to report back to the United States about the political situation in the Netherlands. Of course. So I, I, have, I, I have gone to the party congress for, the, uh, for Terry Baudet. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've gone to the uh, party congress for uh, the Labour Party. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I've, I've had lunch with, with Claver today, uh, but still, well, I, that, I do <laughs> think that there is a slight difference in meeting up with Claver or with political parties, as opposed to Robert Jensen, who is, who's known as one of the biggest conspiracy theorists in the Netherlands. Um, so I, think and who he has might a, be who has a fairly significant following in the does, Netherlands. He does, he does, he so does. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm not quite sure we've, we've set the date. Uh, but there was a, a columnist who was very critical of me meeting with Jensen. I've we do you invite, understand yes. his point? What's that? I think some people are uncomfortable. Do you understand why they made No, because I'm having lunch with him too. But you're, you don't understand and I'm a, at all the, why some people find it a little bit odd. Not when you have a major political or a, someone that has, I believe, hundreds of, th- mm-hmm. hundreds of thousands of followers here in the Netherlands uh, and saying... I'm going to meet with him. Mm-hmm. All right. Where is the tolerance of the Dutch in terms of saying, as an American ambassador, you can't meet with these people in Dutch society? Okay, but I still think that um, if I read your tweet that, that you're both agreeing on that it's time for truth, what truth are you agreeing upon? No, we're not agreeing on any truth. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's, 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 it's mm-hmm. the search for truth. All right. Uh, and a search for understanding. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I will have, if I have a, um, you know, I've got lunch with, um, you know, a number of political party leaders uh, in, in, the, in the coming weeks. 
And by talking to each of them, I will be able to report and give a better assessment uh, for my uh, that we as a team will have as to what are the dynamics of Dutch politics yeah. uh, than if I just talk to one or if I just talk to four or five of the political parties, or if I just talk to the coalition uh, party members and said, oh, okay, I talked to the coalition, they're in power, I now understand Dutch politics. Mm -hmm. If I talked to, yeah, I, right now I don't know how many political parties there are. Uh, Too, many. It's, Too many. I think, we're at, I think we may be to, to 15 or 16. If, if, but, you know, it's kind of like my objective would be to talk to all of them. Uh, and in the, last, uh, in the last 12 to 18 months, we probably... Uh, I have a pretty consistent pattern of reaching out uh, and talking with at least 12 of them. Uh, yeah. And the, you know, there's two that the, there's two or three that just refuse to say, Pete, we, you know, uh, we, we really have no interest in sitting down and talking with you. It's kind of like, mm -hmm. okay, that's fine. Yeah. Cause I, I want to talk to you about this conundrum that I think you understand, which is at the same time, the difficulty with Jensen is that he is someone that has provided disinformation and, and you know that he has some conspiracy theories, but Operating on the, I guess, principles we laid out before, the entire issue with the COVID pandemic, to a certain degree, is that we listened to China because it was notoriously providing disinformation. But at the same time, there's no issue with you having a conversation with Jensen, who's also known for providing disinformation. Can you hold the two different applications separate, or should we be consistent in both? Do you get where I'm going with this? No. I mean, we're still talking yeah. to China. Yeah, but okay, it's, we it's talk to China difficult. every day. Yeah. I mean, the president is talking with China. We uh, this through this whole pandemic thing. It is. It's not like we've said we are no longer talking to China. But there's an we are talking mm -hmm. to China, and we are confronting yeah. them on this issue. You're but talking think, to China, but also sorry, you're speaking to China, and you're saying you're denouncing some of the things that they've done, which is the disinformation to the World Health Organization, and you're speaking with Jensen, right? Is there something you can denounce and say that you completely it's disagree? It's not my with job in the Netherlands. Job. It's not my job in the Netherlands to denounce any one of your political uh, okay. parties or political consultants and those types of things. Like I said, we're going to be meeting. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to have some. Uh, we're going to have, you know, some inform. You know, uh, some interesting discussions and dialogue mm -hmm. here with people. You're saying, wow. You know, yeah. Pete's, Pete's meeting with them. I wouldn't expect them to meet with him. Um, you know, I spent, uh, I spent a half a day with the, um, um, with the, the folks from Dink. Mm -hmm. Had dinner with them, and we went through uh, uh, Skidum. Because mm -hmm. we sent the letter to all the political parties. And said, hey. also have Bitterbala. Yeah, no, I don't think we had Bitterbala. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what we went to, we, we sent the letter to all the mm -hmm. political parties mm -hmm. yeah. saying, hey, Pete would love to meet with you. You, you tell us how you'd like to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Odette calls back and says, hey, I want you to come to my party congress. Would you please speak at my party congress? Yeah. I mm -hmm. said, fine. This is an opportunity for me not to denounce Terry Baudette or whatever, but for me to go to 3,000 people and tell them America's story mm -hmm. and America's priorities. Um, yeah. Like I said, I got invited to the labor conference i yeah. went dink called and said you know pete what we'd really like to do is we'd like you to we'd like you to come to skidum we want to walk with you through the community mm -hmm. uh we, yeah. we've got some people we'd like you to meet with and then we'd like you to stay and have dinner with uh, with some of our members or yeah. some of the people from the community yeah. so seven or eight hours later i go back home yeah and it was it was perfect yeah well pete it's been quite the conversation uh, thank you so much for making time for us. Just one final question. What's the thing that you're looking forward to most when this all blows over? Pandemic. What, being the ambassador to the Netherlands? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the, again, the, uh, with the pandemic uh, blowing over, I mean, what the interesting thing is, like I said, I think the Dutch have done a lot of things right. Uh, I can still go for a bike ride. I can go for a walk. Uh, I can go down to the, mm -hmm. the stand down the street, and I can get croquettes and frites. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I, if I need to go to a store, we can pretty much go anywhere. Um, but, you know, I, I think the, the thing that we, we will miss is, or that, that I have missed, you know, actually being going, going back into the embassy uh, and seeing the 250 people that work at the embassy uh, and seeing them on a regular basis. Uh, these are your colleagues. These are the people that 
provide you input in terms of this is, these are the opportunities that we have in front of us as an embassy community. Uh, these are the things we want to work on. This is how we can get better. Uh, so not having that uh, daily interaction uh, with the workforce and the community as a whole. You know, we're about 1,000 people uh, when you take um, the people that work mm -hmm. here, the people that work in the consulate, and then their families. Mm -hmm. yes. And so not having, not having the ability to, on a regular basis to, uh, to see many of them. Uh, we've, you know, we've done an A-B team, so one week uh, yeah. you know, people yeah. can come to the embassy, the next week the others can, but we still encourage most people to work. So there are people that uh, I haven't really seen other than on my computer monitor that I haven't seen for three months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, on that note, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for a wonderful interview. Okay? <laughs> thank you. Well, we'll see what your listeners say, but yeah. uh, yes. No, thank you. Uh, good to be with you. Good to be oh. back with you. Fantastic. Fantastic.